good evening everyone. This is Parshas Akev. And Akev happens to be one of my very favorite Parshas in the whole Chumash. Because in it, there are some very, very important things that I need to talk about because there are so many people who say to me, how do you go around the world and how do you teach Torah and how do you teach Kabbalah and how do you tell non-Jewish people about What's going on in our Torah? And isn't that supposed to be absolutely and totally secret? Well, before we go into this, let's talk about the heel. Let's talk about Akev, the most insignificant part of the body, the heel. But can you imagine that without a heel, your foot wouldn't have support? And without your foot not having support, your legs wouldn't have support. And basically, you would crumble. So just the pure idea of Akev, the pure idea of look at me and look at this insignificant part of me, what tremendous, tremendous significance it has. We pay no attention to it whatsoever. Self-righteousness is something that if it taps us and if it comes into us and if it becomes part of us and if it rules us and if we succumb to it, basically we're giving into the evil inclination and the evil inclination is a very powerful ally in our existence because it makes sure we know what is right and what is wrong. In Parsha's Akev, I think one of the most important things is to remember that nothing that we achieve, that we accomplish, that we know, nothing that we think belongs to us and that we've achieved with our greatness, by our sweat, of our brow. My ability has accumulated this wealth for me. And I quote from the Sikha number 12, Tamos 5744 of the Rebbe. Society teaches our children that my own ability and the strength of my own hand has accumulated this wealth for me, and a child is led to believe being a clever boy. He should use his brain to obtain whatever he desires. And if he desires a friend's sandwich, he will steal it. And being clever, he is unafraid of the authorities for he will devise a way to conceal his theft. No one can tell him what to do. One effective way 
to correct the present situation is to institute a moment of silence in every school devoted to thinking of God at the beginning of the school day before studies begin. This will help a student to utilize his studies for worthy purposes, for justice and righteousness. Then he will act both on his own behalf and on behalf of the public good, and he will come to understand that the public benefit outweighs his personal benefit. Can you imagine that this is what the Rebbe talked about and how things look today when I just read an article that says God is dead in America and fewer Americans than ever go to their institutions of prayer, whatever they may be. God goes up against all other gods. He demolishes and he destroys all nations who are coming up against his people. He wipes out kings, he wipes out enemies of every kind, and he has been by our side and loved us and cherished us even when the children were hardened and stiff-necked and provoked God's anger in so many places to the point where Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, the greatest of all prophets, the humblest of all prophets, turns around and he says, God, if you're going to hurt these people, if you're going to take these children and wipe them off the face of the earth, take me out of your Torah because I am part of them. And Hashem listens again and spares the people. And for a second time, he holds the two tablets in his hands and he is a true leader. And for being a true leader and a lover of Israel, Moshe wanted to take sole responsibility for the breaking of the tablets without incriminating the Jewish people at all. And the second time when he came down, and the second time the rebellions didn't stop, the unbelievable demands on Hashem didn't stop. The attacks against him didn't stop. And even when he died, there were only a few who mourned for him, whereas Aaron, his brother, the lover of peace, was mourned for 30 days. Why is a tzaddik, a righteous person, compared to the tablets, says Rashi. The writings of the tablets represent the soul of the tablets, and the tablets themselves represent their body. The fact that the Ten Commandments are engraved onto tablets is not merely written onto them 
means that the words on the tablet, the soul and the body, became one single indivisible entity. Likewise is the case of a tzaddik. It is not merely that his soul interacts with his body, but the tzaddik's physical life is truly at peace with his soul and that the life of the tzaddik is not a physical life, but a spiritual life. But the life of the tzaddik, if it weren't physical, wouldn't really do us any good now, would it? And the conversation of our tzaddikim and the fact that we must reconnect with them. We must remember them and go to their graves and make them intermediaries with Hashem for us is a tremendously powerful and tremendously important thing that we must do and perhaps, I don't want to say, but perhaps we don't do enough of it. Maybe you forget, maybe you're too busy, maybe you don't have a tzaddik living near you or being buried near you. I am so fortunate. I live 20 meters from the Rambam and the Shla and the great Tanayim. And all I have to do is open up my window every day and there is the great, great, great flame of the Rambam. The, wi the miracles witnessed by this Jewish people are beyond anything that had ever been witnessed before. All of it they saw. All of it they were part of. All of it, they were counted on to look at, to see, to be, and become one with not only them, but all the future generations were present. You and I were present when... Hashem says, and Moses says, in Akev, you should love the convert because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You must fear God, your God. You must serve Him. You must cleave to Him. If you do all the above, then you may swear by his name. How many times have we used God's name in vain? How many times do we swear and we know it's a lie? And we swear anyway because this is what we do in order to be self-righteous. Parshas Akev speaks about the qualities of the land. And there is no equivocation in the Torah at all about what God is talking about. For the land to which you are coming to take possession 
is not bad like the land of Egypt out of which you came where you would plant seed and have no water. No, the land which you are soon crossing over to acquire is a land of arable mountains and plains and it is watered by rains from the sky. A land which God, your God, cares about. The eyes of God Almighty are continuously upon it. From the beginning of the year until the end. Now what is not clear about this language? What is not clear about what is being told us? What is not clear about what Hashem is offering us? You do what I ask you, and you will have this. Second paragraph of the Shema, what will happen if you always listen to my commandments that I'm commanding you regarding them as if you heard them today, and you keep them not a personal gain, but rather out of love for God, your God, and you serve him in prayer, and as a community you serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then, then I will grant the early and the rain the late rains of your land at their proper time and you not your enemies will gather your grain wine and oil I will provide grass in your field for your livestock so that you do not have to take them to pasture at a distance when you will eat you will be satisfied. But when you are in a state of satisfaction, beware not to let your heart be lured away from the Torah, from the Torah. He doesn't say from me. He says from the Torah causing you to go astray and worship other strange God and prostrate yourselves before them. Is there anything that is not clear here? Is there anything that needs to have big psychological explanations of how a person needs to behave. Is there anything hidden in this conversation that is not clear to a child three years old? The Torah is written for us like babies. Since it's our way of life and we're to be taught since we're children, Nothing changes. We're still the children. The children of Hashem, the children of the Almighty, the children, Baruch Hashem, that He loves. It's an incredible conversation about whether or not women are obligated to study and the Talmud says, well, yeah, because you should study, because 
you're going to be teaching. And if you're going to be teaching your family, and if you're going to have sons and daughters, you should know. It's not incumbent on you to study Torah like men do, but the Rebbe says, while in times gone by, women and girls were not taught Torah at all, nowadays it is not only permissible to teach women even the deepest part of Torah, but it is an absolute necessity to do so, for in the modern world, women are no longer confined to the house and they are highly exposed to the marketplace of, sec of secular ideas. Thus, if the policy of not teaching women Torah at advanced levels will be upheld, the result will be that a girl's sophisticated worldly knowledge, which is likely to harbor many ideas that are authentical to Torah, will be insubstantially compensated for by her rudimentary knowledge of Torah. Furthermore, it goes without saying that Hasidic teachings should be taught to women and girls, as this provides a person with the tools to know God your Father and serve Him with a perfect heart in which their obligation is identical to men and boys. Tzicha, Shabbos, Parashat Emor, 57.50. The idea of a Jewish woman being a housefrau of never getting out of the house, of doing nothing but being barefoot and pregnant, was always not the case. From the onset, the Jewish woman is singled out as the backbone of her family, the backbone of her life, of the future of her family. The fact that she cooks, the fact that she cleans, the fact that she makes a home for her family, the fact that she is the spine that holds up the entire family construction is extraordinary and an amazingly important gift that Hashem gave her because it's on the power of the mother, it's on the power of her lighting the candles, of teaching the children, of educating, of making a Jewish home. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I grew up in a traditional home, and when we came to America, everything went down the drain. It was all about business. Yeah, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Yeah, Pesach, Matzahs, Mitzvahs, Chesed. My father was a Lev Shalom a multi-millionaire who gave chesed above and beyond. My mother, after my father's death, continued the chesed. And I, my legacy, is their legacy. The most important thing is that the legacy is to be a Jew, 
to be an unbelievable, incredible, holy human being that listens to what is Yiddishkeit, listens to what is Torah, understands what is Torah. Talmudic precedent that a woman makes a blessing on Torah since her Torah study has independent value appears to be based on Talmudic teaching that even a non-Jew who busies himself with Torah study those parts which pertain to the seven Noahide laws is like a high priest, written in Baba Kama 38a. Tosfos connects this with the verse which, is this, which describes Torah as being more precious than pearls, on which the Talmud expounds that the Torah is more precious than the high priest who enters the inner sanctum of the Beis Hamikdash. From here we see that even though a non-Jew is not obligated in the mitzvah of Torah study for its own sake, He is required to study the Torah only as a means to an end as to how observe, how to observe the Noahide laws which are the basis of humanity. And nevertheless, through the exercise, he can appreciate the unique and precious qualities of Torah. Thus, his Torah study becomes spiritually uplifting in his own right. And certainly it is true for a non-Jew to whom Torah was not given then a Jewish woman can certainly appreciate that the Torah is more precious than pearls and enjoy its study as a spiritually uplifting method to serving God. Based on Likotei Sichot, volume number 14, page 37. These are two immense, immense, immense concepts in this Parsha. And there are six positive mitzvahs, good deeds, and two prohibitions. Not to derive benefit from the ornamentation of an idol and not to possess an object of idol worship or desire benefit from it. So you don't have the statue in your house. But oh, how many things do we have in our house that we worship and that means so much to us and I'm at fault just like everybody else but I've long understood and long desired that the pieces that are special to me and why they are special to me away beyond idol worship, their worship of Hashem's gifts 
and gratitude for Hashem's gifts that He cared to share with me. To bless God after eating bread, because in this parsha it says, Man does not live by bread alone. And what does this mean? It means that unless you take that bread and when you eat it, you make a blessing and you elevate that bread right back to where it came from, who gave it to you in the first place. What is the meaning of that piece of bread? You come right back to the Shefa that God gave you, to the gifts that God gave you, to the abundance that God gave you, to love the converts, not to accept them, not to occasionally have one over, but to love them like Hashem loves them, like how hard is it for them to come back to their Jewish neshamas that was lost for such a long time. I love converts. I respect converts and I think they're the absolutely greatest thing that we can possibly, possibly fathom because they are Balei Tshuva and they need to every single day reaffirm their choices to fear God, to pray to God to associate with and attach ourselves to Torah scholars, to swear by God's name when taking an oath. This is one Parsha. In this Parsha, pretty much everything is contained. Because if you take Vehafta Larecha Kamocha, if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you will love the convert. You will fear God. You will pray to God. You will associate and attach yourself to Torah scholars and you swear by God's name when taking an oath. And you won't have to worry about idols because you are so close and so connected to a Kaddosh Baruch Hu. You are so involved and so full of reading his Torah, learning his Torah, connecting with his Torah, loving his Torah, understanding his Torah, sharing his Torah, bringing his Torah into places where there is none, illuminating his Torah. Oh, my friends, the power of this love of Torah is beyond pearls. This love of Torah is beyond understanding and yet it is the blueprint of life. May a week of blessing shine upon you. Let me share with you at last the key to the conquest 
of the land. Parshas Ekev, seventh reading after Maftir, 11.22. For if you will always be careful to keep these commandments which I am commanding you to keep, to love God your God, to follow all his ways and to cleave to him, then God will drive out these nations from before you and he will take over nations that are greater and stronger than you. Every place upon which your soles of your feet will tread will be yours. Your boundary will be from the desert of the Lebanon and from the river, the Euphrates River, until the Western Sea. No man shall stand before you. God, your God, will cast the fear and dread of you upon all the land where you will tread just like he said to you, I am God, your God, and you shall have none others beside me. When you will always be careful to keep these commandments which I command you to keep, you will have your heart's desire. You will have the peace. You will have the land. You will have the children. You will have the health. You will have the wealth. You will have everything you desire. But you will have nothing if you do not follow Hashem's laws. Believe me, and I'm nothing, and I'm nobody. I'm only a woman, a creation of Hashem, who loves Hashem, who loves her fellow man, and who wants to share the Torah with anybody and everybody who wants and needs to listen. God bless you. Hashem shine His glory upon you and give you a week of nothing but His blessings. Amen, amen.